This is the Critical Conversations podcast, a KPOV special project developed to feature unique perspectives and the courage it takes to go there, challenge mundane thought, and question the norm. Kenny, thank you for joining me on The Point today. Thank you for having me. There's a special screening of the film Blend, Being Black in Bend at Cascades Academy, Thursday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. You shot, edited, and produced this documentary about 10 Black Central Oregonians and their experiences living here. And the story is completely told in first-person interviews. When did you know that that was what the film was going to be? Um, I've had the concept for this film for quite some time, actually. Um, and it uh, everything seemed to kind of just line up with people that I've met over the last two years. Um, and I put the film together uh, just from jump. I knew that uh, typically what happens uh, when stories are told about our experiences, it's usually done from a perspective uh, that's shot through a white lens. Um, and really what ends up happening is the, the actual seriousness of what we encounter, um, not just in, uh, not just as Oregonians, but just as people as a whole, um, usually gets watered down. Uh, editing is a powerful tool, uh, used to create a narrative, uh, in a way that it just really doesn't give the actual full story. It takes away some of the bites and the impact of our experiences, our daily experiences. Um, so I wanted to create a film that uh, provided an unfiltered look at our experiences, uh, whether you know it's raw, uh, sometimes funny, sometimes or, or oftentimes uh, incredibly serious and quite alarming um, for most people that really have haven't taken the time to have deep conversations with us. You mentioned that you knew a lot of the people in the film. Um, did you know them well? Was there anything new that came up that surprised you in the interviews? Um, there were a few things. Uh, yes, I, I know every person uh, that I interviewed. Um, and, you know, through the course of having general conversations, I mean, these are, again, these are the lived experiences that are, uh, we may not have been in the same vicinity as the person, but these are experiences that we know all too well. So, uh, you know, when I sat down with each one of them, while the stories and scenarios and situations were different and new uh, to me, some of the some of the stories that they told, uh, I had never heard before. But unfortunately, it still rings true with the actualities of what we deal with on a daily basis. So yeah, there, there were several stories um, from each person uh, that I interviewed that I had never heard before. Um, and some of them actually even uh, are still on the proverbial cutting room floor, if you will, um, that may come out at some point. Uh, you know, there, there's, I, I shot a lot of footage uh, for this entire, for the entirety of this film. And I wanted to put more in, but I also wanted to keep it short form. Uh, one thing that one of the things that we also have to be very cognizant of is the actual real trauma and re-traumatization of uh, the, the, those experiences and retelling those experiences brings to the surface. Um, because again, while we may speak of these things in past tense, we still encounter new versions of these stories daily. I noticed that a lot of the interviews were with people who were drawn to educating. There were professors and therapists and activists. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned that about bringing up trauma because it, it seems like it's been an exhausting few years for the black people who have to keep explaining everything to everyone. And do you worry about burnout in the community who is in this film? And how do you support each other? Well, I mean, truthfully, um, if we uh, this is something that we do again as i said on a daily basis this is something that our uh, you know the generations before us did on a daily basis this is something you know we are a resilient people we deal with and hear about uh and experience these things um uh, at, at our jobs yeah. in the workplace um in educational institutions in uh in rec recreational spaces 
um, in spaces that are supposed to be safe, like therapy, um, we experiencing experience these things again on a daily basis. And where you know you bring up a very interesting point about having to uh, constantly tell these stories and having to the, the the thing that kind of blows my mind is there are people that have uh, heard our lived experiences, have watched this film, and yet they still continue to perpetuate the same behavior that causes harm. And yet they turn around and still call themselves an ally. You know, we're, we're here. We're great. We're an ally. This is what we want to do. And when they get called on it, when they get called on the things that are causing harm, it seems like it goes one uh, in one ear, out the other. They don't learn anything from it and they don't change. You, we talk about being agents of change. But if you're not going to actually, when you hear something, and you you can't just say i'm oh you know i'm listening to the black community i'm listening i you know we hear you but we have to go past we, we are long past the time of just hearing and listening and we have to move into action you have to change things um if i have a few moments to tell a quick story i was talking to um a friend of mine who had sent out an email uh in relation to something about black history month um and they had sent out that uh, email and they uh, referenced the black community with a lowercase b. And I was on the email chain. I had not had, had a chance to read said email, but I get a phone call from the person that sent the email. And they're like, hey, someone emailed me. Now, I'm the only black person that is on that email chain. But they replied, they said, you know, uh, they called me. And they're like, yes, yeah, someone let me know that I did that and that it was like a bit of a macro I want to apologize. And I wanted to know, let you know that I, well, first, see, should, should I just send out a, uh, a message and correct myself, or do I just correct it moving forward? And that's a very powerful thing when you have people within the white community that are now correcting their, their contemporaries. This is something that is, that we've been saying for years, that it's not our job to continue to educate you. These are things that are really should just be common sense. And when you notice something, you you actually go about and change the behavior. You don't just continue to perpetuate it. You have to change that behavior because if you don't change that behavior, you're no worse than the person that says the N-word. You're no worse than someone th that would uh, have a, would not have a problem with someone getting called the N-word and you don't say anything about it. We have to take these actions to change these things. From the, within the power structures, within the corporate tiers, within the executive branches, we have to actually change these things moving forward so that way we, we can live up to that uh, that nice key phrase that we hear all the time now, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You're going to actually live up to those three letters, you're going to live up to those three words, you actually have to do some change. There is a discussion after the screening on Thursday night. Can you tell me a little bit about what viewers can expect from the post-screening discussion? Well, honestly, the way I handle Q&As um, or facilitate them, whether I'm on the panel or not, um, is really just uh, turning it into a conversation. There's a, And turning it into a into a conversation where people can ask very frank questions and get real answers, whether they're going to like the answer or not. That's a very key portion of this is sometimes when you're doing this work and when you're trying to learn and when you're trying to uh, I look, I look at it like growing pains. It's you, you want to get taller. You want to be able to uh, get, you know, mature, but it hurts. Your, your, your thighs hurt. Your, your, your calves hurt. It, you know, everything's stretching and it feels uncomfortable, but there's no way to grow unless you actually go through that. And yeah, there will be growing pains. So with the panel on Thursday, I anticipate, um, well, I mean, and again, it depends on the temperament of the crowd. If they're going to, uh, depending on the questions that they ask, just know that they're going to get real answers and they're going to hear things that, again, may make them uncomfortable. Um, and it may reveal some additional truths to them that they may otherwise have ignored. I'd like to talk to you about the Ujima Youth Program, which is something you're working on through your job as executive director at the Fathers Group. It combines elements yes. of leadership, academic achievement, culture and awareness, and self-care. The classes are on Sundays from 10 a.m. to noon. And which library are they at? Uh, the classes are actually on Saturday mornings. Okay, um, they're at the Dow. Yeah. 
no worries. Uh, they're at the downtown, downtown. Uh, the downtown branch, uh, right across from the educational district building. Um, and yeah, we've been doing GEMA for a couple of years now. Um, our students that go through the program, well, we used to do it on Wednesday afternoons on the half days. Um, and we would meet at the district building and it would be, you know, great time. But now with us expanding over and moving to the library and uh, moving it to Saturday mornings, that makes it uh, a lower barrier for students that may have sports on Wednesday afternoons or uh, their parents are working and they can't get them over there and they don't have access to the bus systems. Um, so Saturday mornings have m increased our attendance. Um, we have reformatted how we do our classes and our classes are dynamic. The first class uh, at the beginning of the semester was with Ben Film um, and that's part one of two. And that class uh, was teaching the students uh, the concepts of how to make a movie, uh, whether it's talking about blocking, whether it's talking about um, scene staging, storyboarding, how to, you know, edit certain editing techniques and what have you. But the cool part about how we do things with Ujima is we take it a step further than just learning. So with Ben Film, the, uh, their second class will be at the very end of the semester and the students will present a short movie that they created and they were broken up into different groups. So there's going to be a bunch of movies that will probably be about three to five minutes long and we're going to sandwich those all together. We're going to have ourselves a nice Ujima film festival, but we're going to take it a step further and those films will then be entered into the Ben Film Festival um, as a student submission. Oh, so that's these great. kids, Yeah, so these <laughs> kids are going into this program that is a free program, um, and they're getting um, instruction on things that ha are very much of interest to them. Uh, we just had a our part one of our woodworking class where the kids are making mancala boards, um, and then uh, they will then be able to take those and take it a step further into you know the real world. They'll be able to actually take it and to have something that's tangible. Having tangibles right now is the biggest thing for our community. So the kids will be able to uh, have access to something that's usually gate kept from them. Um, and it's just a straight gateway instead of a gate kept. It's a gateway to something bigger and better. And I had obviously Blend uh, was in the Ben Film Festival last year. Um, so no, going through that experience, I think the kids are going to have a blast. I've heard you say before that the word Ujima means collective work. Can you tell me a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit about what that means to you? Yes, um, in in our Ujima classes, we also give the students at the very beginning of each class a uh, Swahili vocabulary. Um, and Ujima is a word in Swahili that does the American translation is collective work, but uh, we actually had an instructor come in. Uh, two semesters ago uh, that was giving some deeper Swahili lessons. And he said, while the American translation is collective work, in Swahili, it actually goes a, a bit deeper. It means uh, shared labor. So what that means is think of it as if you're trying to carry a canoe and get it to, and get it to the water. You can, you know, carry, try to lift it, get it on a dolly, or you can try to move yourself, but if we all want to get into the canoe, if we all want to get in the boat, then we all grab a portion of it and we carry it together. That's the shared labor to be able to get to the prize. That's the shared labor to be able to accomplish something. So with Ujima, this is something to where I've seen students that go to different schools and had never met before. They now look for each other out the windows waiting for uh, the other students to arrive. And when they get there, it's like a mini family reunion every single week to where they get together, they see each other. And now, you know, it's a bit different than when I was a kid uh, to where, I mean, we had pagers and beepers. We didn't have cell phones. Um, so the kids can still be in contact via social media. They can email, call, whatever. But when, just being able to see each other and have that camaraderie and being able to help each other, you know, sometimes when we're doing the vocabulary words and doing recaps, they will, you know, they will try to help each other and coach each other. We have tutors that come in and then the other students will come around and they will all work together on the assignments. It's a beautiful thing to uh, to see and seeing the kids actually embrace that sense of community, that unity is is, is everything for me. It's, I said this to David, our uh, the president of our board this past Saturday during class, watching the kids 
uh, working working on gluing their boards together uh, in preparation to make their Moncala boards. The, uh, I just I I live for this. I love watching these students thrive, um, and just being able to share that with them and help them through things is I mean it's it's everything. I noticed the classes are taught by a wide variety of teachers. Tell me about how teachers get involved with Ujima. Um, we, uh, I mean, we have community partners uh, that we all personally know, and as Jima has continued to grow, we've had people reach out to us. You know, we are working with uh, Project Bike uh, next this Saturday coming up. They will be uh, teaching kids uh, bike maintenance and safety, and then there's going to be a secondary class after that toward the later end of the uh, semester where they will uh, quite possibly be going on a group bike ride, which we're excited about. Um, but the, you know, the we we are always out in the community. Our board members are uh, very diverse in their professions. Um, we have, I like to say, professors that are on our board. Uh, we have a lot of educators, mental health specialists. We have um, entertainers, music artists. So we all know different people within the community. And yeah, there's some cross-pollination, but we know uh, several different people all throughout the community. And we're able to find people that are very dynamic, that we know that have a heart for kids and education. And we invite them to come in and usually we give them an idea or let them know that uh, we would like them to teach. And then they develop something right off the bat. And then they run it by us and we're like, yeah, that would be a great class. We have Vamanos outside teach the kids about photography and how there are some uh, innate racism built into programming and cameras to where cameras are configured for only certain types of skin tones and then it doesn't work with their auto settings that's a problem so we taught teach the kids how to shoot um for our skin tones so uh again we we, we do a lot of outreach but we have got to the point now to where people are now reaching out to us i know i'm not the only one wondering about this what's in the works for juneteenth Juneteenth. Are you excited? Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So Juneteenth right now is pretty much consuming everything, uh, which is which is which is great yeah. because th th this is uh, last year we had uh, the festival over two days at Drake Park. We had over eleven thousand people come through the park over the course of those two days. This year we're expecting an even larger crowd. Uh, this year we are the theme is discovering our roots. Um, we are really focusing on showing the connection of the homeland back in Africa and how the influences of the dance, the music, the arts, the education influences our culture and global culture uh, in the past, present, and how we look to the future. Um, our educational modules are incredibly robust. We have about nine different partners that's going to be going into the history of food, history of music, history of dance, um, showcasing um, well, I do believe we're going to have several films uh, with a partnership with Tin Pan Theater. Um, we end in film. Uh, our entertainment stage is going to be ridiculous, have some great performances lined up. Um, the food is going to be ridiculous as well. Um, that he's gonna, uh, we're going to have our food tent over. And the one thing I do want to make mention of is we do have uh, this year for the first time ever, the uh, uh, a scavenger hunt called the Journey to Juneteenth that kicked off on February twentieth, um, but it's going to run all the way through until the first day of the uh, of the festival. So you have time to get in. I will throw out the first hint. It's very easy to find. Uh, we want people to be able to uh, find it. The first leg of the scavenger hunt will it is over at Open Space Event Studios. You'll have to go look for Sankofa Bird. That's S A N K A. F O A, I just spelled that completely wrong. Sorry, uh, but uh, the sake of a bird, uh, you'll look for that and a QR code. You scan that QR code, and that's going to kick you off right into uh, the very first leg of the scavenger hunt. This is going to take you uh, through a journey of learning about the history of Juneteenth. It's going to uh, teach you um, about some of our culture and history. Uh, throughout the scavenger hunt, you're going to have to collect each image at every single leg and we have several partners that obviously i can't reveal who they are but just think of this as a bit of a hyper condensed amazing race around uh, around them um several of our partners uh are involved and each uh leg of the scavenger hunt releases well actually i'm not even going to give that away you just need okay. to go scan the qr code over at open space <laughs> and go ahead and get started the second leg was released today not going to tell you where it is because you have to get involved. 
Um, but I'll just say, look for the Sankofa bird around town over the next several months. You'll see it. Wow. So it is somewhat spread out where there is. I know you don't want to give too much away, but there is some time between different clues being released until it spreads Absolutely. out until June 10th. Yeah, so the the final clue will be, re- uh, the, or actually I should say the final leg of the race will be on the day of Juneteenth at the park. Um, but if you just go to the park and try to get those uh, get those legs done and you haven't done any of the, any of the other legs, you're not going to be able to win. Now, I will say the prize that we are working on right now, um, the starter pack of the grand prize is one of every bit of Juneteenth merch that we uh, generate, including uh, there was just a music video that was released to a new song uh, called Juneteenth that was released by uh, David Merritt of uh, CTS Entertainment, also the president of our board. Um, but you can also, uh, you know, again, it, it's all inclusive when you when you actually get into like, and the thing is, when you go to each leg, like say, for instance, you just happen upon one of the legs, uh, say in a month and a half, and you scan it, it's going to show you, tell you how to get to the very first one and to go ahead and go through. But if you start now, you're going to be ahead of everyone else. So highly encourage you to do that. It's going to be really fun. Uh, we're working on some contributions from some of our partners to go into the prize packs. But if you if you went to June Camp last year, you already know that the gear that we had available then was amazing this year it's going to be even more dope so we really hope uh hope everyone gets excited about it you get to meet some of your neighbors you get to meet some of uh some amazing vendors some great locations and you get to learn something along the way where is it this year and what days okay this year it is also at uh drake park um it's going to be on the 17th and the 18th of june uh the 19th we are working on a some programming out at alpen glow park um, on the actual day of Juneteenth in the evening, something just kind of kind of like the cool down from the festival. Um, but uh, the festival last year we went from eleven to six thirty on both days. This year I believe it's eleven to seven thirty on day one, eleven to six thirty on day two. It's gonna be a really good time to get to know your neighbors. The film Blend Being Black and Bend is showing at Cascades Academy Thursday, February twenty third at six p.m. Ajima classes are Saturdays, ten a.m. to noon at the downtown Deschutes Public Library. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kenny, but you can find out more about all these things at thefathersgroup.org. Correct. I was I was just about to give you <laughs> give you those the, thefathersgroup.org as well as JuneteenthCentralOR.com. Thank you so much for joining me on the point today. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to a KPOV Critical Conversation. To hear more engaging interviews on important topics, please visit kpov.org slash critical conversations.